Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Community Hour. Polly's already in prime with lots of sage advice for everybody. I think Gabby's ready to go. She's got all the comments yeah. dialed up. It looks like we've already got a couple, so it's great to see everybody uh, in the room getting ready to uh, chat and have our discussion today. We've got uh, New York Redneck. Good to, good to see you and, and uh, hear from you. And Isaac and Conrad Homestead. Awesome. Good crew already to begin with. Um, I think tonight will be really fun. Uh, we were... We were debating what to do tonight. We almost didn't do the live stream yeah. today. Uh, we just came off of two days of really pretty intensive training. We were doing a tracking class for our local fire department. Um, so it's, it's tracking for like search and rescue and the like. And uh, we were doing that on top of like our normal work schedule and all the other 20,000 things we do. So we're riding on a little bit of sleep, but we were able to get a little bit of a nap in. So we decided, let's go for it. Let's do it. But uh, we decided that the most important thing to talk about right now is food production. Um, real practical for food production. Like how do people really either start or jump start their food production? Like really start making a lot of food quickly. Yeah. Um, that's really so relevant. There are so many channels that do a much better job at presenting really good research and factual, really well checked sources about like what's happening with the food supply. So I don't really need to do that. Um, you could go to a whole lot of folks. Uh, Yanasa TV, he's a commodities trader, a former commodities trader. Um, he does a really good job of breaking that stuff down. Uh, a lot of folks are familiar with Ice Age Farmer. He does a really good job of, um, he just uses mainstream media sources, which I like. Um, you know, even though we all have problems with the mainstream media, he uses kind of like their sources to show what's really happening in the world. So all that aside, we know that really rough things are happening to the food supply. We're personally finally seeing it on the ground. We've been anticipating this for a year or two when pi prices would start to skyrocket. And we're just now starting to get that sticker shock. Yeah. So the question is, how do we really get food production off the ground? So basically, this is a, a permit patch has made it. Yay! <laughs> I don't know if uh, Billy's sitting behind the laptop or William or who uh, who all is there, but uh, good to see y'all. Um, great channel, everybody, to follow. They're, the uh, the breakdowns and advice on that are just so concise and clear. Uh, we're just you watching could, their chicken tractor. Yeah, video, yeah. We're just watching chicken tractor on steroids. Um, <laughs> you could not watch any other channel and and learn everything you need to know about at least. I'm about how to run a farm on that. but So the, today will be a little bit of talking on our part, but this is really a brainstorm session on what have you done that works to really quickly get food production going? Um, and how do you think of, and how do you conceptualize the entirety of your system? Um, so I'll just jump right in and say that for me, before you ever think about it, putting a seed in the ground or vegetables or anything like that, the number thing, one thing you need is fertility. And so you need something that's producing manure. You really need a manure generation machine. Everywhere you can find manure, you should collect it, <laughs> including yeah. including human manure. Um, I have not got to that stage yet. I did a video a while back about how we use our septic system. Um, so we don't really have to deal with human manure so much, which is nice. I don't really want to be carrying buckets out of a uh, um, <laughs> composting toilet. I've done that, and it's, it's a great system, but uh, I'd rather not. Yeah. Um, but really what you need before you can garden – truly self-sufficiently is animals. If you don't have animals, you're going to have to go out and buy compost. It's going to be probably of inferior quality. It's going to be expensive. We don't know what your access will be to that in the future. And you don't know if there's persistent herbicides or other troublesome things um, inside of that compost. So you got to be able to generate the manure to make the right kind of compost. And then you need the, the mulch component as well. You need like your greens, your woody matter. Um, I'm not a very exact composter. Um, I just use whatever I just the whole thing of our entire garden is what can I get my hands on and I will use that. Um, so we have kind of a, I guess you could say like a three part system we have. And this this uh, little small property we're in here, this fix and flip um, has been really good for do, for learning food production because we're so limited. We have maybe yeah. a couple hundred square feet of garden space that actually gets enough sunlight. And that's forced me to work in a small space and do it much more intensively. Um, and I've learned a lot by doing that. We're going to take when we take that to our five acres. Um, Be we're going to apply all of those learnings and yeah, and, and keep that intensive really management going on. And when I say intensive, it's actually pretty lazy, but it's regular. Uh, we probably really regular just about every single day, spend 10 minutes a day in the garden, yeah. maybe five, some days, maybe a couple days a week, I skip it. And then maybe more like 20 or 30 minutes some days, but it's not a lot of time, but it's very regular. So the weeds never get out of hand. Um, I'm composting constantly, but anyway, let's, let's go back to the beginning of the system. The beginning of our system is the rabbits and the chickens. And we have them in a really tiny space right now. If you are in, in most settings, even in an, in an apartment, Holly is knocking over everything, I'm sorry. 
She likes to be as destructive as possible during videos. Even in an apartment, you could actually raise rabbits. They're silent. Um, if you're emptying their, if you're cleaning out the cage constantly, they're clean. They're not too smelly. Um, if you're not emptying out their, their housing, mm -hmm. they are smelly. Um, but right away, you can use that. So if you're at day one and you want to start your food production right now, rabbits are the way to go because you, the other ones, the other animals, you have to age their compost. Rabbits, you don't. And there is something you're magical super in low. it. Yeah, there's well, like not intense at all. Yeah, you They're could raise them in a garage. You could raise them. In, we're raising ours in a laundry room, um, <laughs> and we have enough with our breeding pairs. We could produce probably about three to four hundred pounds of meat every year, um, with mostly internal inputs as well. We do buy grain, but we mostly buy organic hay for them, and then we feed them tons of greens. Rabbits can subsist off a lot more greens, I think, than than chickens can. They process it really well. So they're so great for any kind of survival setting, but also just for food production on a budget. Um, and food, food, food production in a hurry. They're really good for that. Right away, you get your usable. You can apply that manure directly to the garden. You don't have to age it. You don't have to compost it. When you do compost it, though, it makes some magic compost. Mm -hmm. This garden this year has been the easiest I've ever done. Um, and we basically just took rabbit manure, and we made our layered compost. We kind of did a really informal, lazy version of 18-day compost. Actually, Billy's got some phenomenal videos on that on Permapastures Farm. Um, I guess William actually heads up most of the compost thing there. I don't want credit where credit is due. He's the compost <laughs> master. Um, but we were pretty informed. We do all the layering and we turn every couple of days and we cover it with a tarp. And we do most of the things for the 18 day compost. You know, we miss a few days and we get a little lazy. And so maybe it takes a little more like 30 days. But boy, that compost really is fast. phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really fast. It changes color quickly. And, and uh, you know, I wasn't sure if it was really done. I, I, I did the test, I thought, but I've had no problems with the garden. Um, we do, we layer on all winter long and, and we also just mulch everything on um, just directly. Yeah, we we just, I'll, I'll just open the window and I'll throw food scraps right out into our garden. <laughs> it's that close to the house, which is phenomenal. So we get our manures and then we get everything we can to put in the compost bin. Absolutely anything. Hay from the, the hutch is great. Leaves, which we chop up with a mower. That's the only machinery we use on the farm. Uh, the only large machinery. Leaves, grass clippings from the, from the lawn. Um, sticks, lots of sticks from Fallen Tree. Every yeah. stick I have goes in there. All of our food scraps go in there. Of course, coffee grounds, any kind, any kind of anything organic. I'll stick whole animal carcasses in there. The other day we had a pheasant. The uh, fire department had a pheasant hunt and we weren't sure about the safety of it because it was kind of sitting out in the fire truck all day. <laughs> so we decided <laughs> we were just going to compost that pheasant and we did and uh, stuck it right at the center of the pile and, and uh, it, it, there yeah. was no smell. Uh, I took care of that whole carcass of that decent sized bird. So we go, we do that for about 30 days. We make some solid compost and we just layer it on, layer it on. There's no such thing as con too much compost about it. Like I just put on it, I put it on as fast as I can make it and I make it as fast as I can. That's my whole farm system. How much compost can I make? How fast can I make it? The second I put it down, okay, now I have a place to grow more food. Uh, before we go past the rabbits real quick, um, Conrad Homestead asked, I was wondering what you feed your rabbits and what breeds breed you have. Mm, yeah, so a great question. Um, so we have New Zealand's and we have Californians, both great meat production. Um, not pure. I don't, they don't have any papers or anything like that. They're just basic good, you know, they're good breeding stock from folks I know from Facebook groups, um, homesteading Facebook groups. And they're people like I kind of came to trust and like, and the breeding stock was really good. You want to make sure you're getting good breeding stock that are not inbred or anything like that. Uh, but yeah, Californians and New Zealand's, they produce abundantly. Now, I do want to experiment with more old heritage breeds that might be better at foraging because eventually I, I don't really like having my animals in cages. So I want to build a more yeah. of a tractoring system for the rabbits. Um, but, you know, we're we're all living in a very small space <laughs> right now. Gabby and I included Holly, the dog included. You know, we're all sacrificing while we build up a new homestead. So um, I don't feel too bad about the rabbits being in a little bit of confinement. Um, I make their life as good as I can. But anyway, so what we feed them is just standard rabbit food for right now. Um, I looked at the price of organic and decided against it. I decided there's enough processing going on to lock up any kind of chemicals that are in the rabbit food. Um, and it appeared that there were, were not any troubles with the persistent herbicides, which can be really hard to get rid of. So I do use standard rabbit feed. Uh, I found a great source locally for organic hay. If you can develop a relationship with somebody that's growing hay organically, and I don't follow any of the rules about giving Timothy hay when they're this age and do this. It's, it's just a mix. It's a mixture. They grow everything. Everything that grows in that field, they just let grow. 
and they bale it up and call it organic hay. And that's what I buy. And my rabbits are phenomenally healthy. I've not had a single death. I had one earlier when, when they were born. Yeah. One escaped through a cage and got stuck. And it was kind of sad. I didn't see it and it died. Um, but we've had no diseases. We've had no issues. There. And, and that's in a kind of a confined space. But uh, and then I get, um, I've been giving them as much air as I can, as much interaction as I can. Um, I actually believe that it's important to make sure their lives are not boring and stuff, even for rabbits. But anyway, so we do hay, we do feed in no particular amounts. Like sometimes when I have, I'm, I'm a little short on hay right now and there's not going to be any more for a few months until they start harvesting again. So my hay rations are going down and my feed I'm increasing. Um, we do a lot of greens too. And then greens and grass and scraps. Yeah. If we're, a lot of our compost will go through that. Not a lot, but a lot of our specifically things like turnip greens and things that rabbits like. Um, they'll go into the cage, but the amount of grass and clover that I put through there is probably about half of their diet. Yeah, you um, know a lot. And I just go on do I just leave patches along where I don't mow, especially good clover patches, high protein, good white clover. I let that get real high. It's easy to pick. I can go out there and in 30 seconds, I have a big giant bundle of grass and um, of clover. And while I want to do a tractor eating system to make that more efficient, it's really it's 30 seconds to grab their food for the day for, yeah. for a lot of meat production. Like it's really cool. Um, so yeah, it's probably close to half at least. And so I'm supplementing that cutting my feed bill way down, but my goal is to get to no feed bill. Mm -hmm. So what I'm feeding them now is different than what I'm trying to get to on the five acre site. We're planting out specifically for the rabbits. We're growing buckwheat. We're growing Timothy hay. We're growing lots of clovers. Um, and we're working especially hard on experimenting around with, perennial crops tree haze so willow uh sumac maple there's a lot of high protein fruit tree forages which are phenomenal because you think about what a tree is doing it's reaching 30 feet 50 feet 100 feet underground it's shooting roots way into this ancient soil and and it's gathering these resources that are, is definitely not in just that top layer of soil so you're you're farming on a third on a fourth dimension or whatever you want to say um <laughs> You're thinking of another dimension. You're farming downwards, and you can um, trees are getting a lot of nutrients from other sources as well. Um, and they're taller, so they're not. If you have it like on the back side of your garden, on the north side, you're getting all of that sunlight that's not really blocking your garden. Mm -hmm. um, so, oh, and mulberry is another one. They really like the leaves off of mulberries, and then we like to eat the, the leaves. So, there's a lot of incredibly useless, useful perennials that you can plant for them, and we're focusing heavily on that because. You're not self-sufficient if you're depending on grains and feed. Uh, yeah. We can already see it just with all the food shortages, grains, the, it's going to be the first to go. So if anything, your chickens are a liability and your rabbits are a liability if you don't have yeah. a means of feeding them. So it's time to like right now start experimenting with that. Do not depend on feed. Um, we're filling up barrels with feed as fast as we can afford to buy it. We're stocking up. Pretty much any time we go to town. we. <laughs> I'm already seeing shortages. My, my Our feed store guy is unable to get a lot of stuff. Um, I've gone in several times and there was not rabbit feed. So um, I'm definitely prepping feed. I'm prepping feed more than I'm prepping our food. Um, because I, as long as I have a good pile of feed, I can cut down on their feed. Maybe they're not going to grow as fast and I can supplement it with more grass. Yeah. And, and I'm trying to sprint to those systems being up and running to where I'm completely self-sufficient. Uh, when we get there, our garden will have no inputs, nothing on a property. We can produce food pretty much indefinitely just with what we have. Mm -hmm. So that's the meat end or the, the <laughs> more important meat is the manure. Honestly, their manure is way more important to me than their meat. Yeah. But their meat is important. Rabbit meat, you can get a lot of production out of. Um, and then now we've, we've got chickens introduced into our system. They're yeah. still little. Um, chickens are good because they do a lot of jobs. In addition to producing good manure and good meat and endless eggs. And by the way, eggs are better than meat in a lot of ways because you're not processing it. Yeah. You're not processing it. You're not freezing it. So it's constant protein. Protein is kind of a hard one to get proteins and fats in a system. So it's constant, it's low maintenance, and what you can use eggs in anything. We mm -hmm. we don't make rice anymore without frying up some eggs into it. Like you can turn anything to a protein based dish with eggs. Uh, Conrad Homestead said sumac for tree hay. Yeah, so yeah. we're still researching that. What I've heard is that the sumac is not the highest protein. We just happen to have a lot of it, and we want to leave it in because the it's such a cool plant. The the berries can make a lemonade like drink. You can actually smoke the leaves like tobacco. They're like they taste like a fruity flavor. Mm -hmm. We tried it. Um, they don't have any kind of like psychotropic effect or anything like that. Um, but hey, with the uh, with the flavored cigar ban, you know, so that they want to yeah. ban that to make sure everyone in the inner city is really pissed off and <laughs> having nixtron withdrawals in the next few months so that they riot. But, you know, it's good. Maybe you can start a business there selling selling uh, nature's flavored cigars. But yeah. um, 
So, uh, but I don't think it's the highest protein, but uh, I do know the rabbits will chew on the sticks as well and get what they need from the sticks. So yeah, um, comfrey, can comfrey be used with rabbits, permapastures farm? I think so. I need to double check. Um, I've heard a lot of people say yes, but I've not like actually done the research on that. When we, right now, all our, all of our comfrey is just going into the production of more comfrey. We're not even using it on the garden. We're just letting it get big and dividing up roots and making more because you can't really buy comfrey hardly at all anymore right now. It's so valuable. It's so desired. Um, we're actually trying to get it to the point where it'll be a cash crop and we can start selling root stock. Um, and I'll let everyone here know first when we get to that point. Um, but I've heard that comfrey can be used with rabbits, but I, I would have to double check that. Um, I'm sure Google could, could do you well on that one. Um, I wish I knew the answer, but I, I just have not been feeding them comfrey leaves. Um, because my top priority is getting when it comes to comfrey is just planting more comfrey. I've heard they're not comfrey is not good for dogs to eat. It's one weird thing I've heard. I don't think a dog's don't gonna know. eat comfrey. I've, I mean, just if they're walking through the garden, they might chew on it. I don't know. I mean, Holly so I don't eats know garbage, if that has so. anything to do with it. the things we've seen Holly eat. <laughs> like true. comfrey's yeah. not gonna kill her. <laughs> Nothing can kill her. She can. That's eat just a she weird wants. thing I've heard. So I didn't know if it applied to other animals or just dogs for yeah. some. Weird uh, so. We basically covered our manure generation and our meat production. And of course we're, we're planting out for chickens and, and we're going to do mainly pastured poultry. Um, we're going to try, we're going to actually do a myriad of methods. We're not going to do any one thing because there's different purposes. We want to separate our breeds out because anytime we bring animals onto the farm, we want them to be a breeding stock and cash crop as well. So we separate our chicken breeds. And so we have different systems for the different breeds so that we kind of naturally have them segregated like that. Um, We'll have like a basic backyard flock that's more diverse too. So we have just some diverse genetics, but we will have, we'll probably try Billy's uh, um, chicken tractor on steroids here pretty soon. And then we're doing more standard chicken tractors we've just built from scraps. And then we're going to do a stationary coop as well. And that's going to be more of our mulch system. Like mm -hmm. all of our mulch and compost is just going to go into that stationary system and it'll just keep generating mulch that we'll just take right out into the rest of the system. Um, so that's covering that end. And from there, we move on to the garden and vegetable production mainly and fruit production. Um, and of course, perennial production and grains and things like that. Um, but first, before we step on, let's let's go ahead and get to some more questions here. Um, Perma pastor, yeah, we're splitting comfrey as well. Yeah, I don't I don't think right now, if you've got comfrey, I would just like, there's plenty of other ways to get fertility. I would just like grow it out, chop up that root, root stock, spread it out. Because I, I think you could probably make a, a pretty penny selling it right now. Everybody, mm -hmm. everybody wants comfrey. It's a great dynamic accumulator. I actually just like it for the ease of use. There's plenty of like you can use any weed, basically anything that's got a big leaf and it's got a decent tap root. It's going to work pretty similarly. It's just that comfrey is really good at it and it's got all the medicinal uses. But it's easy to work with. It the leaves are so big they're just really easy to use as a mulch. It's, it's a it's a great plant to work with. Um, let's see. Uh, do we have any questions I've missed here? Um, there's something about rabbit urine as a pesticide. Oh, Freedom Inc. Thanks for, uh, some folks are coming over from uh, Freedom Inc. who's been sending folks over here. So thank you, Freedom Inc., for uh, sending people over here. You know, we're, we obviously, any growth on the channel is great. Um, by the way, if you like these live streams, a lot more people do see them. So there's a lot more interaction so we can get the message of food production out a little bit faster and easier. Um, we're, we're, of course, just wanting to grow the channel as much as we can and get more like-minded people into here. Um, so yeah, thank you, Freedom Inc. We've got Freedom Inc. in there. Who else do we have? Stephanie, good to see you. Tactical Tennessean. Sounds like we need to meet up, Tactical Tennessean. <laughs> I'd love to know what part of Tennessee you're in. Permapasture says corn just went up $1 yeah. last week in my town. We all better be thinking about plan B. Yeah, I think we need to make plan B, plan A as fast as possible. Um, because also like, even if everything wasn't collapsing, like why yeah. not produce all of your own inputs and know every single thing that's going into your food? And not be like, and they, besides the cost of bringing in food, there's the driving to the store. There's the time you put in. Yeah. Um, then you have a bag that you need to throw away and, and deal with a waste stream. Um, so a self-contained system, that's really what we should all be striving for. Um, I also love what, uh, what Billy is doing with uh, his chickens. He brings in a lot of food scraps. And he's got a route and uh, try, try to talk Billy out of his food scrap sources. You, you, mm -hmm. you could you could waterboard Billy. He would not tell you where he gets <laughs> his food scraps. He will not give up his sources. Um, but that's a great way. If you can find food scraps and bring them onto your farm, you know, that's a ton, a ton. Like, that's money in the bank right there. We haven't done too much of that yet just because it's a, it's a lot of time to go out um, and, and hustle up food scraps. But if we come across any low-hanging fruit, no pun intended, we will, we will definitely be incorporating food scraps. We're going to probably talk to a restaurant locally here pretty soon. We, we might just like drop off a barrel 
and say, hey, if you fill it up, we'll we'll take it. We'll, we'll even give you a little it, yeah. cash, you know. At the end of the week. Uh, New York Red Egg. I'm going with a 500-gallon plastic septic tank to store all of my dried goods in and then start construction on my root cellar. That's a cool idea. There's mm -hmm. a lot of ways to improvise storage. We're improvising storage with metal barrels. We just happen to have access to cheap metal food-grade barrels from the local dump. By the way, check with your local dump. See what they have yeah. laying around. Sometimes they have buckets. They have a lot of useful things you can buy or get for free. But uh, that's what we're storing. They're airtight. They're phenomenal. We're just filling them up with grains, 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 grains. We could also put our regular food in it. Um, also, as we built our house, we made the crawl space a little bit taller and made that into our root mm -hmm. cellar, which is a great mm -hmm. way to go about it. But yeah. every person, every homestead should have a root cellar, really, unless you're in some kind of climate where that doesn't work for some reason. But, uh, yeah, get a root cellar. It's it's crucial to the system, I think, especially if you're not relying on a massive amount of power. Maybe if you have a billion dollars for tons of solar panels and you can just run all the refrigerators you want, that's fine. But if you want to get, like, family-sized food preservation, you got to have a root cellar. Um, Isaac, hello, Isaac. Who else do we have in here? Such a great crew tonight. A uh, lot of lot of great interaction. T T L R Inc. And he was sent over by Freedom Inc. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Stephanie's in there. Redbone, welcome, Redbone and Austin. Wow, a lot of folks sent over by Freedom Inc. Thank you. Tactical Tennessean. Okay, so we're all we're all. Uh, oh, uh, Prompt says I'll text you my my easy honey holes, but you got to keep it secret. <laughs> we probably won't be driving up to, to uh, the yeah, Carolinas right. to get food anyway, so uh, we're not there yet. Society might be going there. <laughs> of course, fuel prices are going to match the rise, and you know it's, it's inflation yeah. across the board, hyperinflation. It's a topic for another day, but anyway, so we talked about food production as far as meat. So then we get to the meat, eggs, and manure. So and compost. So now we're to the the traditional part of food production that most people think of, which is the garden. And my gardening system is as chaotic as it can possibly be. I just throw as much organic matter onto those beds as fast as I can. All winter long, I wasn't even doing compost. I was putting everything yeah. directly on. Just throwing hay directly on, sticks right on. Um, uh, when I have to use the uh, the facilities, I generally, if it's dark out, I'll step outside. My neighbors might see me on the security cameras, but uh, I step outside <laughs> and I uh, did, did it right on the beds. Um, human urine is sterile and, and it's returning a surplus back to the system. It's much more sterile and easy to work with than like human manure. It's the, the urine is really easy. Um, and you know, you are your lar largest livestock probably unless you have cattle or goats or something like you yeah. are, think of yourself as, as livestock in a way, like you're, you're consuming the most food. So therefore you need to be using your yeah, output. Um, and so then when spring came and we planted, then we did, then we started being more careful and conscientious about how we applied our, our fertility after that. And so what I do is I, I plant out a row. Ideally, it germinates. If it doesn't, I plant it out again. I don't even stress yeah, about just it. Just throw something else in. It's season. like, it's not meant to be. Mm -hmm. I don't even test my soil. I just throw something else in. And once stuff, once plants get to a height where they're not going to get knocked over by mulch, immediately I start composting and mulching around them. Um, I use the compost as mulch. I use those terms interchangeably really a lot. Um, so I start composting around. That keeps the weeds from popping up and starts feeding them. And it, it defines where you need to work with. But my system is working with a really small space in the garden with really rich soil and, and just do, I don't allow spaces when there's spaces, there's weeds. And when, if I can't get to planting out a bare spot right away, that's fine. I just throw some compost. If some weeds pop up, I don't mind the weeds. They're, they're, they're just photosynthesizing for me. They're taking that energy from the water and sun and they're, they're throwing it into the soil. So they're still working for me. The weeds are, I love seeing weeds in my garden. And when you make your soil easy, I weed like this. I just grab a handful. It all yeah. just, it mm -hmm. falls out. It's so easy to weed. Um, and I don't we I don't ever just weed. I never go out just to do weeds. When I weed, doing something I've else. exposed a spot. Why would I not put a seed in that spot? Now the cost is that as you do that system and you have like failed areas and you fill them in with more seeds, it gets chaotic and you'll lose track of, of what's planted where. I don't stress about it. Um, you you learn better which leaf is which as it's small, um, and eventually you just recognize what's a weed and what's not. You just have to make some, you have to kill some stuff. Last last year we weeded out our carrots accidentally. You know you have to kill a few <laughs> things. Um, but once you learn that system, you can just get used to it intuitively. The food production is so easy. It's a dream. Like I want to garden more than I'm gardening far more. I want to spend more time out there. I'm too busy, but like it's so little time coming. I don't have to think like, Oh no, yeah. I need to get out and garden more. Just like, but when I walk outside to like get in my car to drive to Nashville to, to work, that's usually like my garden time. It's like, Oh, I'll just swing by the garden real quick and, and work for a couple of minutes before I leave. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, I mean, we're getting serious food production off that tiny space. Um, so there's no like name for my system or, and there's nothing revolutionary about it. Um, it's just a matter of just like, if there's a bare spot, throw more compost, throw more seeds, 
just grow. And actually what we're trying to work on is do that year round. So here in the middle of Tennessee, yeah, I think we can grow pretty much year round. When we get to winter, we'll focus on things like, um, uh, we'll, we'll do a lot of radishes, turnips, carrots can stay in the soil. Um, they can stay year round, um, winter greens. And then we're also going to focus on getting coverage over those as fast as we can. So it's almost like we're planning an area that will become a high tunnel and then we just try to make it a high tunnel in time. <laughs> so we start the bed, start planting out and just consider that a year round place because when it's year round, then it becomes a system and you just make that compost year round, you throw it on there year round and there's never like spring planting. There's never a lot of work. There's never any tilling certainly. Doing it. It's just five to 10 minutes a day mm -hmm. for, for like really serious food production for two people. Um, of course, we're going to step that up a lot. We want to get to 100% as quickly as possible. And then we want to get to surplus. But I think that year round is, I think there's something there. Because it's a, when you get into a habit with gardening and food production, yeah, and it just becomes a part of your life, it all suddenly falls into place and all the drudge work disappears. There's no drudge work in our garden. There's not a moment of that that I don't enjoy immensely. I, I, I want to garden way more than I'm gardening, honestly. Um, that's really the basics of our of our food production. That's about all there is to it. I don't worry about bugs. I let them have some. Like they 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 let me know which plants are sickly and need to be removed. Um, they 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 take the weak genetics away, and so I don't save seeds from the bug eating stuff. But you can still eat a bug eating lettuce or something. Yeah. Um, if I we found, have something really good, we just let it go to seed. If yeah. Something's mm -hmm. get really big. Oh so yeah, that's another always... crucial part. Mm -hmm. Seed saving needs to be a part of your cycle. It's all a cycle, and it should be endless. I think we need to drop the mindset of like spring planting. That's that doesn't work well when you think because like there's there, more just like phases you plant gardening. constantly and you need to learn what to plant at different times of the year you know we do a lot of radishes and cold weather and peas in the early spring we, we were starting stuff way back in february um and then we'll, we'll do it again yeah. in the fall and then we have our hot weather things we have like different greens that do better in the hot weather and different greens that do better in the cold weather yeah and we're learning what all those are because you know we always want greens um another big key is that we're not worrying about really what we grow we have over 250 varieties of different seeds and we're just growing whatever we can grow. We don't like, we will eat whatever we grow. Um, and that's <laughs> the fun of it because then your co cooking is always a fun challenge. Like, Oh, what do we have to work with today? All right. Tons of kale. So what are we going to make with tons of kale? Um, and we're actually going to start covering cooking as content a lot more on this channel. Um, we don't worry about deer brows. I just plant more. If the deer, or even the rabbits, bugs, really, we don't worry bugs, about bugs, deer, like, ants termites it doesn't have to be pretty <laughs> i don't care what's in my garden um and when you let the it when you let a balanced amount of animals in there then the predators stay at a good level and so you don't have too many ants you don't have too many aphids you don't have too many of anything like just be lazy y'all be, be lazy and consistent <laughs> lazy and consistent that's the musician's credo <laughs> and it's it's definitely a musician's garden yeah um, now you may not be the personality type that likes that. I think the beauty of gardening is that different personality types like different ways of doing yeah. it. If you're a really engineering minded person, you're going to probably like do like hydroponics or some crazy system where you want to overthink and over engineer everything <laughs> um, and make systems and use lots of PVC and beds and aquaponics and, and fish. And, and th there's a, think, nothing wrong with that. That's yeah. just a different way of doing things. Also, everyone should be able to do it on very minimal, yeah. you know, ha needing to not have as, you know all of those things stuff breaks down you, like yeah. what are you gonna do when you can't get pvc anymore like yeah. we have so I to think it's helpful to have yeah, those skill sets but exactly. then you know play around with and be whatever about way these. you want to. we have to assume we're not going to be able to get yeah. anything we have to assume we're not going to be able to get fossil fuels so that's why i'm going to switch more to like kind of billy's system of um chickens doing the shredding up because right now i use a mower to shred up my leaves and my grass so that it composts faster but we're going to need chickens to do that and they're very good at that and they enjoy doing it for us they're yeah. great employees um, so we're just assuming we're working from the assumption that, and we're building our system around not having a tractor, not having mechanization at all. Number one, it cuts your expenses down to nothing. It reduces your danger. Like how many, we were just learning about how many accidents happen with tractors, like oh, tractors yeah. and death traps. Um, any kind of machinery we can weed out is one less thing to maintain, one less thing to pay Safety for. Issues, and yeah. we're not depending on the electricity or the fuel because I, if you believe that like, that people are serious about what they say. For example, United Nations ideologies like Agenda 21, 2030, they really do intend to chase people out of rural areas and you know how they're gonna do that. They're gonna cut off oil. They're gonna cut off your access to the things you need ranging from internet to gasoline to electricity. Um, and, and that's not really conspiracy theory because I'm from Oregon. I saw all this play out already. I've, I've seen them attacking rural areas forever. I was just talking to my mom for, happy, for Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, mothers. <laughs> 
uh, call your mom. <laughs> um, and she was telling me like she wants to log she off an area to plant to yeah. do a pasture. She can't clear her but own she's land. She's in a riparian. She's zone in a riparian zone. Yeah, <laughs> she can't clear her own land. This stuff is real. I grew up watching Agenda Twenty One be implemented in my community, and it destroyed Oregon. You know, it, it became a totalitarian, and that's why I'm trying to like scream and warn all my neighbors here in Tennessee, like, hey, y'all building codes and things like that, you allow a little bit of tyranny in and it gets out of hand really quickly. Okay, well, so that's that's our garden system boiled down um, and our food production system. What we're gonna experiment next with is grains because Gabby's a baker and we're gonna just keep adding different kinds of animals. We're gonna be getting ducks soon. And of course, we'll keep everybody posted on our successes and failures. Uh, we have some cool comments here to get to. Conrad is 20 minutes north of Tennessee border. We got to get up there. I go to Kentucky all the time. Gabby's folks live in Indiana, so we're always driving that way. So we love meeting people off the channel. We've not had a bad experience yet. We've, we've yeah. just loved everybody we've met and made phenomenal friends. We've made like our best friends in the last year yeah. off of this channel. <laughs> um, it's amazing when you meet like-minded people. Uh, Stephanie's Dixon. I forgot you were in Dixon, Stephanie. We really need to, yeah, we definitely need to meet up. Uh, that We are yeah, definitely so neighbors. <laughs> we will uh, bring a bunch of seedlings over and, and trade some stuff. Um, tactical Tennessee is getting moved out there. Uh, yeah, tactical, uh, Tennessee and let me know when you're coming out and I'll, I'll make some recommendations. Conrad Homestead. Retirement area for Northern States. There are far fewer people who share the same value. Yeah. Northern States <clears throat> and the West coast where I'm from, people do not share the same mindset. Those people exist. Certainly. Uh, I know we have, um, some folks on here from Oregon and they're like-minded and great folks, but like to me in Oregon, there's this incredible acceptance of tyranny. People will just put it up and they will sell their neighbor right down the road. And I love Oregon. Oregon is always going to own my heart. Uh, it's the most beautiful place on earth. And I grew up there. My family was, you know, settlers a long way back. Um, uh, I love Oregon. And maybe someday in a few decades after all the stuff we're about to have to go through as a nation, maybe it will be restored to a freedom loving place. But it's not now. You can't pursue the American dream. I could never own a home. None of my peers over there, except for a few yeah, who are doing really well financially. Yeah, they're like one like one of my nephews is like outfitting a van to live in right now, yeah. um, and and he works hard. He has a good job, and not that there's anything wrong with living in a van. I've lived out of a van. I had a lot of fun, but like that's that's being seen as a real housing solution over there. They're going to the pod housing, and like tiny houses are like a good solution for getting started on a farm. But also like there's an element of just like squalor with it too. It's like and you can't like have a family. You know? Yeah, like <laughs> we're really at the bare. Well, we just built is about four hundred or. Uh, 576 okay. square feet that's the bare minimum we're actually pretty much in a tiny house now but like these are temporary we're not going to try to raise a yeah. full family in here you have to be practical like you need to think about real food storage a tiny house i'm not bashing that's on tiny houses real. i love yeah. i love actually the concept of tiny house if you're gonna have a family you need a lot of food storage you need a big pantry you can't just do this kitchen yeah. thing that looks great it's on not YouTube. conducive to self-sufficiency yeah. at you, all you need, now you can do a small house because small. we build way bigger houses than we need around here yeah um this this one is only 16 by 24 and it's been adequate but it's crowded for two people very crowded for a dog <laughs> um i i see tiny houses more as a transitory step actually it's just like the old settlers used to build a log cabin and that would work for 10 years while they built their big old farmhouse and you still see that on the old homesteads around here yeah um for our new property like we're also thinking of tiny houses being like they'll become airbnbs and stuff like that later so not bashed on tiny houses and everyone has a different set of goals and different life experience. And, and you can certainly make a tiny house work. Yeah. I've seen families make them work for a lot of people. I don't think they're all they're cracked up to be as a permanent solution, but they have their place in the system. Yeah. yeah. Um, and temporary could be five years. You know, we don't have kids yet, but like when, when, and if we do, we know we're going to need more space. We, there's been a good experience being in a really small space to realize like there's just practical reasons you need more space mm -hmm. for yeah. sure. Sugar Creek Homestead of Tennessee. I think year-round planting is the way to go as well, yeah. And I think you could actually extrapolate that to northern states and Minnesota and Michigan. And in those cold climates, you're just going to have to get a little more plastic, a little more windows on the land, and just uh, improvise more. I've seen a really cool system where they take, they make kind of a little mini hoop house out of PVC on a hinge, and they build a raised bed, and then they just have this hinged, um, this hinged little miniature greenhouse, basically. And they prop it up with a stick. They can let it rain, and then they just close it when, when it gets too cold. And as long as you're diligent about it and you don't let it stay open when it's too cold, year-round production, you can grow greens, you can grow radishes. You can especially grow those cold weather crops that already don't mind a little bit of frost temperature. You can grow them year-round without the need for, like, electricity and heating in your greenhouse. Um, we're also going to be building a small one on the south side of our house, and we'll do a lot of year-round yeah. production on that. 
Um, and of course you do shift away to way more, to less food production in the winter. That's always gonna be the case in anything except for a tropical environment. Um, so we'll do lots of preservation, lots of root cellar stuff, but we're still gonna grow year round because we just wanna think that way. We want to be in the habit of, we want to do the same thing in the garden year round. I don't like remembering stuff. Yeah. Uh, I just like- Or like feeling like you're restarting every, yeah. every year. Yeah, letting it get out of hand, letting it get weedy. There's no reason for that. And also, I don't want to work unless – every time I do any work, I like to do many functions. So, for example, I pull a weed, stick a seed in, throw in compost. I just fertilize that area. I got rid of the weed, and I planted it out all in the same quick motion. Um, it's a much better use of time with it. Uh, Perman Bashers has a really interesting question. Are y'all seeing tons of folks from California and New York moving onto your area? If so, are they assimilating or attempting to change your area into what they? This area left? is exploding, particularly with people from New York and California. Thus I far, most of them most, are coming with like they're good people. We want most them. Of, yeah, most of we the out of towners here. here are actually the people who are most involved. They're more serious in than the, the locals. The locals the are community. watching TV all day long. Not all. We have wonderful folks on here who are big into food production. Yeah. But I'd say a large percentage of the locals in this county sitting in front of a TV all day. Yeah. Not living off of not welfare. Getting involved in the not getting involved in the community. Not, you know, here in the fire department. You know. Yeah, they complain about everything, but they don't do anything about it. Um, they complain about their government, but they don't come up with the solutions. Again, not everybody. There are no we love this county. We love the people. Yeah, we it. love it. But we also don't have this thing against newcomers coming in because, well, first of all, we're kind of newcomers. We've only been here two years. But also, like, it does seem like most of the people are coming in, they're running away. And they have more knowledge than the locals do yeah. of what's coming of what's down the pike. Just like me coming from Oregon, I saw tyranny since I was a child. You know, I was an, I was an anarchist before I knew what the word meant because mm -hmm. I saw what happened. I saw how farmers could not, the people, the farms I grew up on couldn't farm anymore because of the tyranny. And they couldn't log anymore because of the tyranny. So, and I saw it all start with, like, building codes. And then it became more and more draconian to the point where it's like $45,000 to even start building a house in Oregon if they'll let you. And they probably won't let you build a house on your own land. Yeah. Um, they even had a bill recently to try to ban any new single family housing. Like, yeah. They are exactly. sprinting for this Agenda 21 shit. Mm -hmm. That's that's what they're doing. Um, and it's coming here. Like I try to tell people. That's why I love Tennessee, though, because I do think there's a mindset here where people are yeah. not going to allow it. Even a lot of the people we've interacted with um, through building our, our house – um, have, have talked about that, how there are certain, you know, things that have happened at the county level here where mm -hmm. codes have been put into place and, and they're kind of against it as well. So and our goal it's is good to, to even have like the builders here. We are going to remove people. building codes in our county. Yeah. Um, we, we're trying to, we, we can, you can influence plan. legislation. You really can influence politics in a small town and in a small county. That's why you need to be in a rural area among many other reasons. And especially like our codes are so new. Our, yeah. I think our, codes department yeah. has only been around for like 10 or 15 years so we have an opportunity to and to we're really content creators so we take that role seriously we think god made us to to put information into the world that's our that's what we were made to do you know if you're a plumber you're made to plumb if you're a writer you're made to write if you're a musician you're made to make music and so were you taking that role seriously and we're putting information out and figuring out how to do this more locally you know because it's different like this channel is you know anybody can watch it but we're trying to figure out how to talk to people more locally and regionally and and really but reveal what's going on. Yeah, also expose people to things that are happening outside of of here too, because it is mm -hmm. relevant. It is yeah relevant to show the trend and the, happening in places just like mm -hmm. this. And the more and, we do that, the more we see the agenda that's coming down the pike. We're we just found out that we are in what's called the Mega Regions Plan, which is a uh, I think it's by the American Developers Association. It's one of those creepy pseudo government organizations. It's really basically yeah. a private corporation. <laughs> that uh, influences a lot of legislation and um, they advise lobby. municipalities and they lobby and they get their tentacles in there um, and then they profit from it, you know, with the, in conjunction with their crony developers. And so they've included this in this mega regions plan. I would encourage you to research the mega regions because basically it's the Hunger Games setup. It, it's, it's their future. It's what they're going to do, which is condense all of the people into major cities and then to the small suburbs, suburbs around them. In this case, we're an hour away from a major city, but we're on the outside of that mega regions plan because of the main highway that we're on. They want development to go out that way. And basically they want to govern it centrally and pull all of the resources, just like they've been doing since the industrial revolution, pull them out of our rural yeah. areas into the center core. Um, so basically when you watch Hunger Games, we would probably be the equivalent of a Katniss's <laughs> family, yeah. you know, crossing over the wire into the next county over to go hunting uh, <laughs> on the King's forest. <laughs> <laughs> 
but like really that's what it's looking at here. So we're, we're putting that out on community pages and we're getting that, we're, we're telling people about it. So suddenly all of these secretive plans that were ha happening behind the scenes are exposed and now people are aware and, and they weren't supposed to be aware and they're going to start standing up. We have a lot of creepy things happening out here. We've been having a uh, big hedge funds from New York, buying up all of our commercial buildings, they even bought our courthouse and government buildings. Um, and they're very, very shadowy type people. Like we can't find any research, like anything on them. They're very discreet and they have billions backing them. Um, so it's very strange because we're in a very rural area, but we're on the outer edge of this urbanization of this agenda yeah. 21 stuff. But actually that's kind of where we want to be because people here are very liberty minded. It's very rural. It's going to be very hard to enforce anything here. Um, but also there's going to be a lot of trade and exchange with the city because we, we do need wealth comes from trade. You can be self-sufficient. But if you want to to build capital, build wealth, which is security, you need to have trade. And so we like having we're we're probably we're exactly at an hour from here to downtown Nashville. Yeah. But it's also the geography is rolling hills and forests, so it's not very developable. So we really like it here in Hickman. Um, we are all about eyeballing the next county over, which is a little more rural. Um, we may end up just trying to buy buy places in two places. You know, you you can have your home, but you can also have like another property that might be a business or a rental or mm -hmm. a hunting tract or something like that. We're trying to really kind of like s spread ourselves out, have fallback plans, have bug out properties and do so on a tight budget. But like when we buy a property also, it's to make it, every property purchase we make is to build wealth. It doesn't cost us money. We spend money, we trade useless, you know, inflating fiat currency for an asset that produces indefinitely. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also a topic we want to cover more over time is like, how do you start at entry level? If you're like a millennial or something, you just don't have a lot yeah. of money. How do you get your first land? How do you start working your way up to bigger land? That's what we've been doing. And you know, we're just, move, we keep moving up yeah. in acreage and we just, we, we do not have a lot of money. We trust it too. Yeah. <laughs> we weren't really sure if it was gonna yeah. pan out to be honest, but <laughs> it has. Uh, let's see what else. Retirement, I uh, read that one already. The scenery is great out here. The people, not so much anymore. It gets better once you go further south. Um, yeah, South the Mountains, rural, Tennessee. he says the more rural spots are best though. Yeah. The more rural you get, the less crazy things get for the most part. There's, it's really strange. If you get you in tourist people, areas, it gets a little weird too. Yeah. I think when you have people moving into the more rural parts too, I think that's when you see the people who are not necessarily trying to change things. Like they clearly yeah. moved out to a very rural area for a reason. And like, I think one of our friends, they just bought five acres. Right. And people from out of town, like in Nashville, bought another five acres next to them and they're starting to build something, but they kind of have this idea that they're probably not gonna, <laughs> like they're gonna move out, see the ticks and, you know, sell, sell that lot probably. So it's like, you'll have, there are just certain challenges that I think people who would potentially want to change things too much yeah. would probably get out of town. <laughs> uh, pretty soon. Freedom Inc. has a cool question. This is going to be a fun one. Um, are you an anarchist by definition or the more, more known idea of the term? Meaning without rulers, oh, pro-small nice government, or completely anti-government? Great question. Part of the problem we have in dialogue when you talk about anarchy or when you use the word capitalism or any, any kind of word like that, everybody's got a different, different. definition. Yeah. And so you're not speaking the same language. You can't have a debate until you define what you mean by your term. So excellent question. Thank you for asking that. I tend to gloss over those things. I'm glad you did. Um, I would define myself as a perhaps more of a principled anarchist than a practical one. Um, I do not mean anarchist in like the Antifa sense because that's not an anarchist. That's the opposite of an anarchist. Yeah. Antifa, they're statists. They want a bigger, more draconian, more totalitarian state. That's not anarchy. That's the opposite of anarchy. Anarchy doesn't. Anarchy does not mean Mad Max running around. It's more you know, anarchy and buggies and mohawks. Than <laughs> yeah, anarchy is. A community that just governs it, that take care, takes care of itself and does things consensually without violence. So my definition is, in the ideal society, is building a culture that does not accept the use of violence to take people's money or capital or resources. I consider that to be slavery. So to me, any position other than anarchy is pro-slavery. <laughs> if, if you in any way think that there should even be limited government, then you're saying it's okay to take taxes. It's okay to point a gun at somebody's head and say... I want your time, I want your farm, yeah. I want your labor, I want your capital that you work so hard. I want it because I can use it better. And I'm going to use force and violence to take it from you, and then I'm going to give it and put it where I want. That's evil. That's an evil ideology. 
even libertarianism like it's it's it that's not okay yeah, it's not it's okay not. to steal money from people that's like a it's like a commandment and stuff <laughs> um <laughs> That being said, I'm also very, we're pragmatic here. We have good friends in governance. governance. Um, we were just out doing this training, the, the tracking training we were doing, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of police. Um, there was some jokes about how like, uh, I might be on the other side, I might be learning some of this tracking, so I know how they're gonna be tracking me. But um, <laughs> they're wonderful people, they're idealistic people. The, the cops out here are not bad people, they're, they're yeah. constitutionalists for the most part. They may and a not lot of them are doing that, it but, for very little money. Yeah, like, they're doing it for less than fast food workers. Like we are, like yeah. they're doing it because they care yeah, about so people. They are good people, and there's a lot of people in government here who do care and they work really hard. I remember, Gabby, you told me about the mayor of your town in Indiana, how he would work dawn to dusk for his town. Mm -hmm. um, so there are good people in governance, and we are not out trying to like destroy the government here because also, if we removed our government in this county, which is generally pretty un inintrusive for the most part. If we were to remove them, that would create a power vacuum, and then people would panic and say, "And I think this is kind of what's going to happen, mm -hmm. you know? Hey, let's bring in this more this uh, this global government because they're the best option right now. We don't want chaos because it'll stage chaos. So we're not pursuing in that sense. What what our course, what my course of action is, my personal course of action and belief is that all government is bad, but chances are it's going to exist for a long time. Yeah. So I seek to build a culture." and to educate that people in it, it in. and to show options. For example, here on the fire department, we have very little government money coming in. Yeah. And Gabby and I are working hard on fundraising so that we can show, hey, we can fund this fire department ourselves. And we don't, government is just a hindrance to us at this point. They really are a hindrance. They don't really help us other than the central dispatching thing. But, um, you know, we're seeing like, can we really address these things? Can we come up with solutions? Because we have no right trying to remove government until we have solutions and can mm -hmm. prove the models because otherwise, People are going to be terrified, and they're, they're not going to go along with it, and they will always, always accept government. But I don't think government is inevitable. I don't believe that. Um, as a, And I think it takes us standing up and finding those alternative solutions yeah. to really show you know, people in government that, like, hey, we really don't need you. <laughs> and we have to accept that there is no perfect system. You exactly. know, when people say, like, you know, what about the violence? I would say, well, look at – the government perpetrates yeah, the violence, like, so but that doesn't violence. mean that it's going to be a utopian, happy, perfect world with no violence if you get rid of government. I think it'll be less violent. I think when, when there's nothing standing between you and your neighbor, and you could both inflict violence upon each other, you quickly you become quickly best become friends become with your neighbor. Alliances. And here in this rural area, we already basically live in anarchy out here. Honestly, for all intents and purposes, we don't live in the city limits. Police would never be here in time for anything. No. They don't come to our block. They don't come for meth labs. They don't come for children being abused. They don't come for anything. They don't. They come sometimes. But they'll then they'll maybe show they up. They don't do anything. Write yeah. some paperwork and leave and do nothing. Yeah. Um. So we we are essentially ungoverned. Now we do have some resources. We have like well the electricity is a co op. That's not government. Yeah. Um. We do have city water here, but we don't need that. Um. The roads not maintained. When was the last time you saw this road maintained? I think one time in the oh. last three years. Uh, truck pulled up and they like took three shovelfuls of asphalt and dumped <laughs> that on the road. That was like a month ago yeah. too. <laughs> we, we maintain our own stuff. So like there's really no government. They're, they're not protecting us. Um, the fire trucks are across the street, so we don't yeah. need that from the government. Um, <laughs> Which is probably a really unique situation for yeah, us. But, yeah. so. but like that's your problem. You're in charge of fire, of fire protection on your homestead. Yeah. Um, but so that that's my position as an anarchist is, is, is more practical is coming up with solutions and being positive about it and saying, here's a better way to do things. Um, but I do believe that all government is inherently evil and uh, always has been, always will be since the time of judges when God told the Israelites to not have kings. And he said, you yourselves will become the slaves. Before that, they just had judges and the judges didn't even have any enforcement power. The judges were, were just kind. mediators and they were yeah. elected by con consensus, basically people saying this guy's an upright person or this woman, there's female judges in the Bible too, like Deborah. Um, this person is so respected in the community. When we have a dispute between two people, we're going to go before this respected judge um, and they're going to Tell rule and then, then you're going to probably approach your neighbor. Like, then you're going to say, okay, neighbor, let's say we're fighting over a property line or a sheep or something. And you say, Hey, you know, you, you, you move my property line and you disagree and it comes to, to words. And so you go to be before this mediator when they rule, you know, have like consensus on your side and you're going to say, okay, you need to get, if, if the neighbor then doesn't follow through, that's when you begin to introduce violence into the system and you get together with, because then your other neighbors are going to rally behind you when this respected person came forward and said, yeah, this person is the wrong. 
they're going to rally behind you and then you're going to go and you're going to have that power force to say, hey, you need to do what's right here. And that sounds like scary. Like, oh no, anarchy, people using violence to or threat of violence. But what is law enforcement? It's pointing a gun at somebody, throwing them in the cage. In my experience, when we've had to deal with like justice or disputes here, we did it outside of the system. It was much more loving. It was better for everybody. Nobody got hurt. Um, and it was based on consensus between all the neighbors. And it was only when the problem got really bad too. Mm -hmm. um, it was a better solution and it always will be. I, I really don't buy into this myth that if there's not government, we're all just going to be out shooting at each yeah. other. You're not going to shoot your neighbor because he has friends neighbor. too. Yeah. Like small communities lived in peace for many, many millennia. Relative peace. It's all relative because we don't live in peace now. Yeah. I can mm -hmm. drive right now to a prison where people are being abused and enslaved. It's called an industrial prison. We drove up there the other day. They've got a whole factory of mostly black guys who are slaves. Mm -hmm. Many of them thrown in there over small victimless drug crimes. Some of them are still probably there for weed. Yeah. For, for using a medicinal plant and they're thrown in there and, and thrown into the system. Then they have nothing when they come out. So of course they reoffend and steal because they have yeah. nothing. They can't get a job. A they're trapped in the cycle and it's a well-designed cycle. So we live in a violent system, a violent slavery based system right now. You just don't see it because you're not the victim of it. You're the benefactor probably mm -hmm. in most cases we're the benefactor. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that leaves a lot of people to think about, talk about like social equity and stuff like that. But that's not the answer. The answer is like, stop, stop people from oppressing us. Yeah. That's the answer. It's All right. I knew that'd be a fun tangent. <laughs> you get me talking about anarchy. Oh, you might want to scroll through. Yeah. We have some more comments, comments here. Yeah. Uh, Robin says, my property in East Tennessee is grandfathered in with no restrictions. Yes. Um, that's great. But it shouldn't have to be. Yeah. Nobody has the right to tell you what to do on your own land. Period. Dead stop. Northeast Tennessee. We've got so many Tennessee people here. This is exciting. Yeah. I love Green that. County, East Polk County here. Hello, Tennesseans. Uh, we should let, we're, we're going to do a lot of regional stuff here very soon. Do stay tuned to this channel over the coming months. Um, we're working on some really cool big stuff. Don't want to talk about it just yet because <laughs> we need to finalize some things, but basically, we're going to work on getting people together. Yeah. Um, creating real community. Creating real community and like, cr and like bringing people in, teaching them how to build communities. Like, we're serious about starting a wave of new communities where people are at in Tennessee and then in the rest of the United States. Mm -hmm. um, creating networks too. Like creating networks between networks communities, and... trade networks. Um, he who builds the first trade network and mm -hmm. collapse wins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, like we always have an eye for it. We, we try to think as if we're basically in medieval times because we are. <laughs> <laughs> um, essentially, we're in neo, we're into the early stages of neo feudalism. So um, build, build your lay, empire lay now. the groundwork now. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a fun way to think. It's a fun way. It's like prepping to the extreme. It's like, I'm just going to assume that we're already in the slide because we are. We're in the slide into chaos and totalitarianism. And I'm not going to the totalitarianism. I'm not going to the smart cities. I'm not taking part of that. I'm not complying anymore. Um, I will literally, I'm not, it's not rhetorical when I say I will die free. I, I don't mind dying. I know where I'm going. <laughs> I, I I'll be as free and peaceful and quiet as I can. And just, we're, we're just going to build our communities out here, but we're going to do some events and, uh, Teach people how to build communities as we learn. Yeah. Five minutes from the, how do I say it? Conasaga? I can't pronounce it. River. <laughs> uh, Matt Stone. Hey, Matt. Hey. Oh, Matt Stone's in here. All right. All right. Entertainer. I got to show him what Matt Stone made for me. <laughs> oh, gosh. He's leaving me to the entertainment, and I'm just not a great entertainer. But I'm really excited about what he's going to show you uh, because Matt, he's... I guess sort of one of our neighbors, right? Yeah. Um, 15 minutes down the road. His mom actually uh, is the lady we talk about frequently who has all the, the tomato heirloom lady. tomatoes. Yeah, the tomato Cindy. lady. Hi, what Cindy we, and so Roy, if you're watching. <laughs> yes. So, but he has a really awesome skill. And mm -hmm. Matt, you can. So, this is what Matt Stone made for you. As you all know, probably I'm a musician by trade. <laughs> uh, and Matt is a leather worker. And I think he's into his second year and he made this guitar strap personalized. If I was the crying type, I would have cried when he gave this to me. <laughs> um, so just take a look at some of the, the beautiful artwork on here. And it's got, it's got my name. And then look at that uh, button there right <laughs> up my alley. The Gadsden flag. And then. I love that part. <laughs> So like I will have this my whole life. Like like I love handcrafted items and and the craftsmanship that went into this. Like 
these are the things I want to, I don't want to own anything that's not like handcrafted. Like I love to be surrounded by things that are made by people I know and care about and that are just handcrafted. Like my goal is to get to where everything in our house is like that. Is that yeah. Um, we're uh, working with Matt on getting some like maybe a, a website and stuff up eventually. Yeah. So if y'all want some leather working, we'll, we will definitely put that out on the channel because he does phenomenal work. <laughs> um, I've already got musician friends now lined up that are demanding guitar straps. So we, we need to <laughs> talk with Matt. And, and, yeah. Uh, Perm Patch says, thank you for explaining really anarchism. Anarchism is just common sense and it's the way the world was. Um, and I don't buy into the myth that life was so hard before, yeah. before the industrial revolution. So bad. Yes, it was hard, but like, is it better now? For sure, we probably live longer. It's just as hard, it's just different problems. <laughs> yeah, you live longer and sicker. Yeah. Um, I would rather live a little bit of a shorter and longer. better life. And our life, this last year is a good example of how it's gotten a lot harder and mm -hmm. way more fulfilling, filled with meaning, yeah. exciting, dynamic, and, and the connections we've made with people. I will, I'm ready to trade more struggle for more, yeah. uh, more fulfilling life. Yeah. Um, and so I will take more all the hardships that come too. with it. I don't want the ease and the convenience of cities anymore. That's all cities and the industrial revolution, all that it's, it's given us convenience, but not really. Is it convenient that you can go buy food, but then you have to slave away from dawn to dusk to do it. Yeah. You're slaving away in this system. You're working all day. You're always in debt. You're stressed. You're sick. You're full of diseases. Like nothing about our system is good. And yet we keep buying into this myth that it's so much better. Like, I, I don't just, buy it. It's just too much consuming and not a lot. Like I think I would say, before this we were just like consuming 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 yeah. and then now you feel like you're actually creating and mm -hmm. learning and like even just you know being able to we would have never taken probably man tracking a man yeah. tracking class yeah. had we not you know developed a connection with our neighbor and got kind of voluntold into the whole thing but um now we have this very crucial skill that you know we could use all right. In really intense situations, but yeah. yeah. Um, so we're getting pretty close to an hour here, so I'll just read through all these last comments and, and address them, and uh, then we're going to probably go collapse into bed because we are <laughs> exhausted. As you can tell, Holly is very tired, too. <laughs> uh, she's been working hard all day at being naughty. Yeah. Um, Self-governance, Freedom Inc. says, Self-governance was the foundation of this country. In order to seek what you want, violence is inevitable. Moral violence has a place. Evil and extortion doesn't. Yeah, that's a big question, for, and we're going to do a lot of videos on I'm going to do a lot of videos on that. Um, violence is a hard, hard question. Like, as a Christian and stuff, where where do you fall with that? The Bible's, like, got a lot. You can interpret a lot of ways. There's a lot of, like, sanctioned violence, and then Christ obviously set the example of, passive, of, of pacifistic resistance. Mm -hmm. and he was not passive. He resisted. And at times there was a little bit of violence tipping over tables and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. but it, he was clearly did not do violent revolution. So it's, it's a good question. And it, there's a lot of questions about what's the best app. What's the best way to do things, obviously, like what part of the cycle of history are we in? Is this really going to be like the big one <laughs> where mm -hmm. totalitarianism climbs to a unimaginable peak and basically destroys most life on earth? Like, is that where we're headed? Could very well be in which case maybe revolution is not what we should be focused on. Maybe our revolution should be survival. Yeah. <laughs> um, Revolution takes many. Points. It's a lot of it's like we're on this shaky ground. We're like testing the water. We're like, okay, can we stop it this mm -hmm. time? You know, we we stopped it before in 1776, but like the circumstances are different now, and, and it's hard. Like I'm trying to be very pragmatic and not emotional about it because I'll be honest, I really want to grab the tool and drive to the capitals and do some justice, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm not convinced that's the right thing to do or an effective thing to do. Yeah. In fact, I think they're gonna, as we saw when they stormed the capital, like they'll they'll plan these false flags yeah. and they use it against us um and media and narrative is so powerful i'm days. starting to develop the theory that really what we need to do is get into these rural areas especially ones in the south and midwest where people are like-minded and violence should be d done at a micro level basically you should it should be done to just Set prevent the operation of government of external government in these areas um so not much more than just harrying and stopping supply lines and and just keeping things from happening basically um, and minimizing like not so not it's a really low intensity conflict. Um, I think that's the way to go is just make it making areas that are difficult to govern. When you look at, there's a lot of regions around the world that are like that. You can go to, even in Europe, you go into like the mountains of Georgia and Albania. That's like where most of the, the weed comes from and stuff over there because like those areas are hard to govern. They're mountainous. 
And the empires, every once in a while, some empire will pass through to go invade some other country and then pass through again. But like those areas are always pretty free no matter what happens. Um, and it's because they're hard to govern. And so we really, I think we need to just build a culture of that. We need to educate our own kids. We need to educate our communities. We need to teach people how to be independent because you can't remove government until you're independent. Um, and, and just keep things at a low intensity level. And just that's why I like agorism and um, counter economics. There's no like real violence there. You're just using the system as best you can to not pay taxes, to defund the beast system. Um, but yeah, violence is a, is a reality in life. If if somebody tries to rob you and you say no, that you are committing violence. So not not all violence is the same. It's it's silly for us to say that if you stop a guy from raping a child, that that violence is the same as murdering somebody. It's not. It's not the same. Um, I'm still figuring out what that means, so I don't feel qualified to, to give any moral mm -hmm. positions on it. But I don't think it's right to exclude violence completely because this is the system we live in. Um, a lot of people would disagree with me, and they believe that. And, and I respect anybody that can truly say, if somebody comes in, and walks into my house, especially like Christian people, they're like, I won't, I, I don't want them to go to hell. So, and I know where I'm going, so I will let them kill me. That's an incredible level of bravery, like that the Quakers and people like that have. I have a hard time with that. Um, I'm pretty, pretty old fashioned when it comes to protecting my home and my homestead and my community. Um, but it's a philosophical thing that I'm delving deeply into and, and because it's re it's relevant, we need to decide because if you comply with everything, you're, you're definitely being violent. If you're allowing people to throw people into camps and allowing cops to walk into buildings with guns and shut down businesses against their will and throw pastors into prisons, like what's happening in Canada, incredible tyranny happening there in a Western democracy on the North American continent continent. If you're allowing all that to happen and you're being silent, you are violent. So people need to get off their moral high ground there. Reliance on trust asks, is stopping something violent? Self-defense is not the same kind of violence as offense. The only problem is, as a society, they've learned to bill offensive wars as self-defense. After all, what was 9-11? It was self-defense against a country that had nothing to do with 9-11. We went into a sovereign nation, slaughtered people for no reason. And so we, but we call it the self-defense. So that's the problem with self-defense is it's easy it's to use as an excuse, but you know what's in your heart and you know if you're protecting your family from an offensive attack. Um, I don't see any problem with it, but I'm still exploring that philosophically. Mm -hmm. Freedom Inc. says the problem with this society today is that the constitution isn't known. Freedom isn't known. Example, you are not free when government agents have authority over you. They believe they are. Yeah, people are not free. We're not in a free country. We're in a, in up till now it's been pretty benign but not really even then you like like what if you're the black guy thrown into prison for 10 years on a weed charge that's not a free that's not even remotely free so, you know what if you're an indian whose land was stolen by the federal government and your treaty's broken you've never been free so like some of us have just kind of like not really experienced it until now my family history is has been pretty replete with oppression um the federal all of my Ancestors moved into West Virginia initially into the Appalachians when they first came to America in like the 1600s, um, settled in with native tribes mm -hmm. and really became a part of the traditional landscape. And then I think it was like a century later when the federal government came in or a century and a half and they flooded them out, built dams against their will and, and chased them out of their, their community there. They didn't want those independent people out there. Um, and my family's history has been kind of just gradually moving west to escape the government. And now here I'm like, oh, shoot, I'm out of west. <laughs> and so I went up to Alaska for a while. It wasn't much better. And so here I'm in Tennessee, which is about the freest place that I can find so far. Um, yeah. Constitutionalists, but their very positions are unconstitutional. Yeah. And also, like, the thing with the Constitution, I think it's a great document as far as determining governance. But also, I didn't sign it. So I'm not – I'm a free person. So I don't have to ab abide by something I didn't sign. And in the end, it does establish taxation and it does establish government. So I really like the Declaration of Independence more than the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Sugar Creek Homestead of Tennessee says individual self-reliance is key. Mm -hmm. Self-reliance and, and getting yourself self-sufficient and then getting your community along with you. Because if you if you got a bunch of hungry neighbors, you're not prepped. Yeah. All right. We're running, we're running out here. The thing most people aren't responsible enough to be pure anarchist truth so yeah yeah most people are not responsible but in a truly anarchic society it's a meritocracy so yeah. trust me when people have to step up their game to eat and protect themselves they will you will see all of the useless hangers on who, who are doing nothing with their lives who are just leeching off the system
they will learn and adapt quickly. When you get hungry, you adapt. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody has to worry about me so long as they leave me alone, says Matt. Kiss my ass socialist. <laughs> Great <laughs> channel name. Yeah. Yeah. It's like we are asking so little here. So little. I want nothing. I didn't take any stimuluses. I don't take any of their money. I want nothing from them. They can, people say, you know, what, who will build the roads? I don't care. Don't build the roads. I will adapt. I don't want anybody to point a gun at me and take my money, take my time, tell me how to live. Tell me I can't build a house on my own land. Tell me I can't live free. Tell me I can't garden. Tell me I can't raise animals. Not accepting that. Well, the problem with a lot of those things is the people who are advocating for more regulation have never actually done any of those things. They've never raised any animal. They've never, yeah. you know, they've never tried to grow a garden. So it's like, you don't really have the right to be regulating things that you don't even understand, which is par for the course with our, with our government officials. I mean, how many, we were just, uh, they were talking about um, something exactly like that. Like they're changing the healthcare plans for people in, in our county government, uh, government workers. And there was this change that would save them $1.2 million, but they didn't know how it would impact the employees at all. Mm -hmm. Didn't know how it would impact their families. And in the middle of the meeting, they, they said, well, should we table this so that we can call the health, the health insurance company to see what the change would be for our employees. And they were, they voted no. They were like, no, no. I think we get it. Let's just, let's move forward. <laughs> and so next year, all these people are going to lose coverage for their, like, basically they're going to lose coverage for their families, <laughs> which like, you know, regardless of what you agree, you know, think about government employees having health insurance. Anyway, it's, it's that principle of, you know, our government officials don't even understand yeah. any these and they types never will. of situations, the of, so they shouldn't be regulated. And that's the nature of centralized management. It's never yeah. going to work well. Yeah. We know that. Try man centrally manage like your garden, sense. centrally manage a business, centrally manage anything, and you'll see it fail and collapse. I think that's kind of what like the whole pattern we're in is like only we're seeing like how how much can we centralize things? Yeah. And thus how big can we make this collapse? We're we're basically trusting people who can barely manage their own lives to manage our lives. <laughs> Uh, Reliance on Trust says violence is for the fearful. Reliance has, on Trust has some, some interesting positions on that. And uh, and it's really, I'd like to talk more. Maybe we'll do a stream one of these days. Um, and I don't disagree either. Like, like I said, I'm kind of wrestling with this issue in my life. Um, but if somebody came through that door right now and wanted to do harm to my family, I just, I don't, I'm trying to be a, <laughs> maybe I'm not the person I want to be, but I'm going to respond with force and, and oppose them. I'm just, because the thing is also, if somebody is acting violently in your society, they're doing it to other people. Like, and that's another question. Forget self-defense. What about when somebody's hurting another person? If you don't intervene, you yeah. too are you are being violent by your complicity. So I just don't see any philosophical scenario in which you can completely avoid violence or yeah. force, depending on how you define it. Yeah, violence or force. And yeah, that, that's another one of those words, come, like, how are we defining violence? I would say violence is, is the application of force or the threat. I'm, I'm using it pretty broadly. So if you say, hey, you have to shut down your business um, or we're going to take your liquor license, that doesn't seem that violence, right? But then let's say you say, well, no, I'm not, I'm not shutting down my business. And they take your liquor license and you continue to sell liquor at your bar. And so what are they going to do next? They're going to send cops with guns. And if you don't obey... They're going to use those guns. They're going to shoot you, or they're going to throw you in a cage. That would be it's violence. violence. Yeah. yeah. So, implicit violence like is still violence. Force quickly. If I if I go up to violence. a woman and I say, "Have sex with me, or else I'm going to hurt you," I didn't hurt her, did I? Yeah. So therefore, was that not rape? Was that not violence? Like, of course, it's violence. So, implication or threats are, are still violence, yeah. and that's what our whole system runs on. But I'm still I still can't like wrap my brain around how mm -hmm. you could have a society without it because we are humans living in a in a human, in, we're like, we live in a fallen world. Um, now, like, should we be the example? Yes. Like, like who, who made the greatest change in the world? People like MLK who passively resisted. Mm -hmm. um, there's a case to be made for that and, and be and self-sacrificing because then the whole world sees that, you know, like Lo Lavoy Finicum, you know, walking out of a truck with his hands up and they shot him, but the whole world and people like me saw, and then we changed the and course changed, of our lives yeah. and decided that, yeah, I don't, I don't want to deal with this whole government thing anymore. <laughs> um, so there, I, like I said, I'm really not preaching any one position here. I'm, I'm quite torn on that. I want to get more in, into like these like really deep dive stuff. I don't know if I'll do it on this channel 
Um, I may eventually make a backup channel where we'll do all of that, like really deep dive, mm -hmm. weird, uh, philosophical, religious stuff. And because uh, we have fun with that stuff. We really like getting getting uh, down the rabbit hole pretty far. <laughs> oh, man, we, we got to wrap it up. I'm, we're just having too much fun tonight. We almost didn't do this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we're so tired, but I'm so glad this was actually energizing. Us communicating with y'all is energizing. It makes us happy. Um and we feel like we just feel so the community. We feel the warmth through the laptop here. <laughs> um, we feel like we, we love having y'all here. We love everybody. Um, <laughs> ah, so many, every one of these comments is going to send me on our, down a rabbit hole. Uh, <laughs> democracy is exactly why these things are happening. Yeah, democracy is just mob violence. You know, Rome was a democracy. A, 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 a republic put Christ on the cross and burnt Jerusalem to the ground. A, a, a democracy put Hitler in power. Like. Where do we get this idea that democracy is any better than any other kind of government? It's all the same. In the end, it's all feudalism. It's whoever has the most power and money is controlling everything, including democracies. Mm -hmm. Freedom is an illusion. Yeah, and, and some it isn't just. Yeah, when I say black people, I'm just using that as an example because I'm kind of using the left's own terminology, um, but also to show that like we've allowed ourselves to be divided on right and left when we should be calling that stuff out and saying, yeah, you know what? They're right. Like when they say that like the government is keeping black people down and keeping them in, in using those inner cities as manufacturing machines to produce more bodies more for their machine. Like they are racist and they, they do that stuff based on race and the DNC and, and the, gerrymandering yeah, the gerrymandering and the, the Democrats. Like, you've never probably heard me do much Democrat Republican kind of talk, but specifically the democratic party has specifically been like they've used they farm human beings and they, they do it by race they use race now they're turning the tide against white people more they like all they're doing is changing who they're oppressing though it's like the same concept and i like i will talk about race and stuff all day on this channel i'm not afraid to talk about, i come from a mixed race family um i will never judge anybody based on the race ever um and that's as far as the conversation needs to go to me like and so anybody that's saying anything else any of this crap they're putting in schools about by the way, get your kids out of schools. About like, what are they calling it? Uh, oh, uh, well, I, basically, it's just racist ideology they're teaching that like you should hate white people, you should hate this race, or hate this race. Like it's all the same stuff they've been doing since the beginning of the nation. Um, play one race against another, create a scapegoat while oppressing the one and keeping them down, but tell them that you're helping them and give them de make them dependent on the system. Like it's time to start talking about this. St and not stop. I'm not going to shy away from any of that. You know this channel. I don't shy away from anything. I'll talk about race all day. I don't care. Um, Anybody that that, I mean, that tries to, to do any decision based on the color of your skin is a racist, and I have no time for that. Yeah, no time at all. And we're trying to create a community, and you can't create a community if you're yeah. going to have division. Yeah, that's not a community. Yeah. That's not what America is right mm -hmm. now. Virginia buys prisoners from Connecticut. Yeah, it wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me. You know, prisoners oh, are are slaves theory. in the system. That's what yeah, critical theory. race theory. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just I love to talk about this because like there's also this mindset like if you're a white male, you're not allowed to talk about race or anything like, nope, I will talk about whatever I want. Um, I won't be cowed and I will call out people on the right and on the left. There are people who come onto this channel, too, and try to bring their Nazi, neo-Nazi crap on here and say, um, act like they, well, we don't need to go down that rabbit hole. But like I have no time for the racists on the right or the racists on the left or the bigots in any way like. You know, I fell prey to bigotry in my own life. When I was a child, 9-11 happened. I fell for all that propaganda about how Muslims were the big scary enemy. And we had to go bomb the crap out of Iraq and go invade Afghanistan. Um, I even joined the army, you know, on, those, on, on that belief. And so I am certainly complicit in what has happened. And I have been bigoted before. Um, yeah. I didn't realize it, but I, I fell for that. I fell for that propaganda. I was brainwashed. Um, so at this point, anybody that uses race or religion or anything to divide screw them. I, I'm done listening the second they open their mouths and they start putting out that kind of yeah. vitriolic, divisive speech. Okay, guys, we really should wrap, wrap it up here. We're at 4% too on this battery. <laughs> yeah, we're about, our uh, laptop's about to die. There's still some great comments. I may try to tomorrow do the uh, follow-up video. Um, I've been doing that sometimes, sometimes not. Um, there's a lot to follow up on here, so I, I might do a Monday video tomorrow. Um, but y'all, it's been such a great conversation. I'm sorry we've gone a little long and uh, we can't quite get to everything here. But uh, uh, one last comment is uh, no need to prove how anti-racist we are. Yeah, I'm not here sitting here virtue signaling saying, look at how unracist I am. <laughs> but 
On the other hand, we need to talk about this because whether we like it or not, it's now yeah. being enforced now and injected a as topic. a topic into our culture. And uh, for me, I want to go talk to my neighbors, uh, regardless of their race or of their religion, say like, hey, I'm not a part of whatever happens. And also, you if you, you can believe whatever you want, but like, they're following an old model of totalitarianism, which is pick a scapegoat group, get everyone vitriolic and angry, and place all the problems on that scapegoat group so you attack that group. So you don't say, oh, no, you know, maybe the state is the one that's causing all of these problems. So yeah. it's, it's an old playbook, and so I'm going to call it out. Herring, yeah, it's a red herring. It. <laughs> yeah. So, like, I'm going to talk about it, and I'm not going to shy away from that topic. It, it's a... I take a special pleasure in talking about things I'm not supposed to talk about on this channel. <laughs> That's the beauty of it. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, I've really loved the conversation. Um, I, I want to, we'll, we'll have to do one on just those topics too. Cause like, it's really fun to, to, to get deep diving into all this stuff, but everyone hope you had a great weekend. Hope you're all ready to hit this week hard. Go plant a seed tomorrow. No matter what. Um, I'm trying to do a thing where I, I don't eat food until I go plant a seed in the morning. I haven't really followed through on that totally yet, mm -hmm. but that's, that's one of my goals. So, uh, think tonight about what you're going to plant tomorrow in your garden. Um, look around you, find more mulch, find more compost, get your mm -hmm. systems up and running, get your food up and going. There's not a single one of us. There are some masters of permaculture on here, but I know that we all want to increase the food we're producing. We're not just producing for ourselves. We're showing the world how to produce food without, without a centralized system. And we need to feed our neighbors too. And we need to feed the hungry. Um, I know there's a lot of Christian folks on here and we were pretty specifically told to feed the hungry. Uh, we weren't told to vote for somebody else to feed the hungry or point a gun at somebody and take their money yeah. and feed the hungry. Mm -hmm. You feed the hungry. Yeah. I feed the hungry. And we feed them good food, real food. Feeding them, you know, GMO yeah. mac and cheese is not feeding them. That's not food. <laughs> so you're not feeding the hungry. So grow food, feed the hungry, including ourselves. Everyone stay safe, be well, and happy homesteading. <laughs> Say goodbye, Holly. <laughs> <Is that milk? laughs>